Microbiology is the study of microscopic organisms, some of which can cause the most serious diseases encountered by humans. When a microbe causes disease, physicians around the world are the ones called on to intervene. In many developing parts of the world, access to resources like clean water and basic sanitation is limited. And in those same areas, higher rates of malnutrition, especially among children, often lead to immune suppression, meaning that the microbes in, for example, contaminated water can more easily infect their human hosts. Today, we're going to be talking about a bacterium that measures only about two microns in length. But if it's brought into an area where it can easily spread, this microbe can sweep through a community, causing potentially deadly infectious disease. The most powerful protection we have against infectious diseases like this one is our knowledge of how microbes cause disease, both at the level of the community and at the level of the microbe. In order to effectively prevent and treat infectious diseases, we need to understand the environments in which they're more likely to spread and how the actions of microbes result in the clinical disease. This knowledge can lead to interventions that protect the health of the individual and the society in which they live, as we'll see in this case. Philippe is an eight-year-old boy living in Chapoteau, a village located on an isolated spit of land in Haiti. Since the earthquake that shook the region in 2010, clean drinking water and sanitation remain scarce in Haiti. There are no sewers here, and even latrines are rare. Because of this, Philippe and his brother have already seen firsthand the health consequences of living without access to basic resources. Their father passed away from dehydration due to diarrheal disease three years ago, and determined to protect the health of his family in the future, Philippe's older brother, Jan, had left home a year ago to study medicine at the University of Haiti in Port-au-Prince. He was the first boy in his village to attend medical school. On a visit home last April, just after the spring rains had begun in Haiti, the two brothers were playing soccer when Philippe took a drink from a nearby communal tap. That night, Philippe started having stomach cramps and began having terrible, watery diarrhea. Jan was alarmed when he helped his brother to the makeshift latrine that hung over the water near their home at about two in the morning, and he saw his brother passing what seemed like liters of stool, and the stool reminded him of cloudy white rice water. Jan immediately suspected that his younger brother was suffering from cholera after contracting Vibrio cholerae, the tiny bacterium that infects the small intestine, causing a sudden onset of violent gastrointestinal symptoms. He remembered hearing from his mother that several homes in the area had recently reported family members suffering from a terrible form of diarrhea. Jan thought back to his first year of medical school and remembered learning about the father of epidemiology, a physician by the name of John Snow, who had noticed a similar clustering of cholera in a London neighborhood and had linked the disease back to a contaminated water supply. Remembering his younger brother's choice of water supply that morning, Jan began mentally mapping the families who had been reported ill. They all collected water from that communal source. Jan knew that his next steps would be critical to his brother's survival. Several cholera treatment centers had been opened in Haiti since the disease was first introduced into the area, likely by UN peacekeepers who came to Haiti from Nepal. But the nearest cholera treatment center would have required a two-hour trek, including a river crossing, and Jan knew that infection with Vibrio cholerae could cause rapid dehydration and death in a matter of 12 hours if left untreated. In order to result in disease, a relatively large number of the comma-shaped Vibrio cholerae bacteria need to be ingested because most of them are killed in the acidic environment of the stomach. Vibrio cholerae that have recently been shed by another human are hyperinfectious, meaning that they're better able to survive passage through the stomach. 
Once inside the small intestine, the bacterium uses its flagellum as a propeller and guided by chemotaxis, it swims toward the surface of the intestine and avoids being cleared by peristalsis. When the bacteria reach the surface, they need to overcome another protective mechanism, the thick mucus net that's made by goblet cells to keep bacteria away from the surface of the epithelial cells lining the intestinal tract. Vibrio cholerae makes enzymes, mucinases, that digest the mucus and allow the bacteria to penetrate the mucus. Next, the bacteria need to attach to the epithelial cells, and this is mediated by thread-like appendages that grow out of the bacterial surface called pili or fimbriae. Once the bacterium attaches itself to the cell, it begins producing a toxin that's engulfed by the epithelial cells. Inside the cells, the cholera toxin disrupts the functioning of chloride channels in the cell, allowing large amounts of chloride ion to leave the cell, followed by large amounts of sodium ion. Water in the lumen of the small intestine is no longer able to be absorbed, and patients shed liter volumes of stool. With this stool, the colon loses bicarbonate base, and infected patients become dehydrated and acidotic. The copious amounts of diarrhea seen in cholera patients is actually beneficial to the organism that causes the disease. Vibrio cholerae replicates rapidly inside the small intestine, and the watery stools allow the newly minted bacteria to exit the host and be transmitted to another, usually via fecal-oral contamination. This is why, in parts of the world where running water and sanitation aren't available, cholera can spread quickly and easily. Back at home, Jan sees Philippe deteriorating rapidly. His eyes are sunken, his skin turgor is low, and he's too weak to walk. The young medical student fashions a cholera cot out of a rusted deck chair and asks his mother to begin sterilizing water by boiling it over the kerosene stove. When the water has cooled, Jan mixes six teaspoons of sugar and half a teaspoon of salt into one liter of sterile water, trying to stay calm as he remembers the correct proportions of salt, sugar, and water for a homemade version of oral rehydration solution, or ORS. ORS is considered first-line therapy for cholera, and it's sometimes all that's necessary to set an infected patient on the road to recovery. The sodium and glucose in ORS make use of a different transporter to replenish electrolytes in the host. This allows for rehydration and recovery to occur. In Philippe's case, the ORS saved his life and allowed his family to transport him to a satellite clinic operated by a nonprofit organization about an hour from their home. At the clinic, Philippe received rehydration therapy and the family was given chlorine bleach and advised to sanitize the home and safely dispose of all fecal waste. Jan contacted local government officials and warnings were posted around the contaminated water source with directions on how to decontaminate the water used by Jan and Philippe's neighbors. Oral rehydration therapy can reduce the risk of dying from cholera from 20% to 1% in many parts of the world. By understanding the interactions between socioeconomics and the pathogenesis of infectious disease, medical teams can develop strategies for treating and preventing infectious disease around the world, and health outcomes like Philippe's complete recovery can become the norm instead of the exception.